Welcome to the Art of Guitar podcast. We're here with a very special guest, our first guest, George Loudon. Welcome, George. Hi, thank you. Welcome to Dubai. I'm glad to be here. This is my first time in uh, Dubai. I would have liked for the weather to have been less hot, but, you know, you have to see it in all its glory. <laughs> well, coming from Ireland, where it was 16 degrees. And raining, and was it? Not raining, oh, no. Okay. No, nice yeah. blue skies, but 16 degrees, that's nice. Yes, I remember when Rick, one of our co-founders, came to visit you and we sent all the photos around and it really was like he's meeting a legend and we're meeting you oh, today. Thank you, thank you. So George, the today we wanted to talk about obviously who you are. So let's start with an introduction about who George is and Loudon Guitars, if you can just share with our audience. Okay, so um, I've been making guitars for more years than I like to admit to. It's 40, it's 50 next year, 50 years next year. And I started um, my, well, actually more because I, I tried to make an electric guitar when I was about 17 and it was kind of playable. Um, so it took 50 years. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I started in earnest when I was 24. Um, so it, it did take 50 years almost to get to that point, yeah. So I've been, I've just been working on my own in Ireland and uh, the business has, has got its own momentum, which is a bit of a surprise to me, but I just try and make the guitars as good as I can and I try to innovate, try new designs and uh, I don't copy. Uh, so that's my ethos. One of the things that we were talking about earlier is what makes a good business. Because at the end of the day, you you need to create a good product. You need good business and vice versa. And the fact that you've stuck to your guns, essentially, yes. yeah. and made sure that the product was always better and better. And we're going to see two guitars that you brought with you today. Yeah. Limited edition that we're yeah. very excited about. And mm. we'll, we'll uh, get to them in a little bit. But talk to us about this obsession with creating a beautiful product at a time when maybe the people you started off with have gone a different direction. You've chosen to remain a boutique, we call it, you know, in this world, <laughs> yes. niche, uh -huh. boutique, um, brand mm -hmm. that has its followers. You mm -hmm. talked about the one customer who's who bought, who has 19? 19, I think it 19. was, 19. Yeah. We're going to get to the point very soon when some of our customers are going to get to that level. Yes. And I love the discovery process. Someone comes in, they come in wanting a specific acoustic guitar brand and yes. they're sure about it down yes. to the serial number. <laughs> yes, and the model number. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. the model number. Yeah. And then we say, how about you try Loudon? Yeah. And of course, it's we're still in an infancy market, the Middle East, Dubai. Mm -hmm. People are getting... They're learning about high-end guitars and they've been fantastic and great supporters. And then they play the Loudon and they're like, wow, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to hear about anything else. And they come well, in and they want more and more. But tell us more about what made you get to the point where we can benefit from all that. So when I started, I knew nothing about wood. I didn't know anything about tools. Um, so when you when you start from a very naive position like that, um, you know you have to learn and you have to learn very fast. And I remember telling my father um, that I was going to make guitars as a profession, and he didn't tell me to go and get a, a proper job like a lot of dads would. He just said, "Well, make sure they're good ones." And for me, that is. That's always been what I wanted to do. And because I didn't know how to do anything at the very beginning, um, it made me more, uh, I wasn't copying anybody else because I didn't know enough to do that. So because of that, I was always trying things. I was trying to learn how to use tools, how to sharpen tools, how to work with wood, how to season wood even. I didn't know anything about that either. So I think because of that, because I knew nothing, I was like a sponge. And I, I learned something. I learned a lot from every guitar that I made. And I mean, the first guitars I sold for what we say in Ireland, 50 quid 
50 pounds, you know, and thinking back to that, it's amazing. And that's probably what they were worth, I would I say. I wonder who owns that one. Yeah, I actually, um, do you know what? I don't know where those guitars are. I think they're in, in Northern Ireland somewhere, but I don't know where. Um, the workmanship was terrible, but terrible. I didn't know anything. Um, the heel, which is the part of the guitar uh, where the neck joins the body, is is a kind of signature of of what the maker is like as a craftsman. If it's beautifully shaped and it just all the curves are nice uh, and smooth and elegant. And I think the heel on my first guitar looked like it had been carved on a doorstep. It was so <laughs> it was so bad. I just literally didn't know anything. So I was a sponge and I still am. I still try to learn something from every guitar and I'm fascinated by by the guitar, which is not a perfect instrument. It's nobody has designed one or made one that they can say is perfect. Now I've arrived. You know, I'm, I'm not like that at all. So it's a bit like golf, right? You oh, know. gosh. <laughs> I remember once meeting my, my uh, family doctor on the golf course, and he came to me and he said, oh, hello, George. Have you got any other diseases? <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes. You never get it right. You never get it right. And when you do, when you do, you don't yeah. understand why sometimes. Right. And that's and so, like guitars. And as then well. you want to try it again. And yeah, yeah. exactly. That's exactly e right. E exactly. So we talked a little bit about, you know, where we are with the industry and that it's gone through some good times and hard times and mm -hmm. we've seen them all. Yes. And there's been very different models from uh, brands that want to sell directly to customers yes. and ones who want to go through um, partners like Art of Guitar. Yes. What's your preference? Do you feel that you'd rather have a relationship directly with the customer or do you feel like places like Art of Guitar play a role? What role do they play? Well, of course, I'm in the Art of Guitar at the moment. So uh, in one way... Um, I would have to give the right answer, wouldn't I? But the fact is, I really believe that it's important for um, guitar players to be able to come and p they, you know, have a guitar in their hands and play it and then have another one and play it until they find one that really speaks to them. And uh, it's not, you know, I, I usually tell people it's not about the, it's not about the brand. Um, it's about what the guitar feels like, how does it sound, how does it feel to you, does it inspire you? And even as a very young player, that can make a difference too. So I think it's vital to have, um, uh, to partner with folk like yourselves who, who care about what we do and what you do and who give time t to the players. Yeah, I'm, I mentioned how much our team love Loudon guitars. And that's had a big impact. That's three quarters of the battle. Absolutely. Um, and when they talk to the customer and say, how about you try that? Exactly like the story you mentioned yes. that happened in the London store. In London, yeah. Yes. That's right. So I wanted to talk uh, about Sheeran because mm -hmm. actually our friendship and our relationship with Loudon and George Loudon started with Sheeran. Yep, and that's right, yes. Yes. Yeah. And maybe you were testing us out at the time <laughs> you weren't sure about this you know company in dubai what they're doing but actually it's been it's been a beautiful experience because it brought us a different customer mm -hmm. and some of our best customers yes who moved on to the george loudon the loudon guitars you mean started, they started with sheeran and they, then they, yeah. they bought a sheeran mm -hmm. up front yes maybe out of curiosity sure um, I'm curious. Sharon was with another brand before. Yes. He's incredible. He's come to Dubai twice. He's sold out within a day, within mm -hmm. hours, actually. Okay. He comes on stage with one Just guitar. Just a guitar, yeah. Mm -hmm. You saw that video that went viral with him on a Volvo, I think. In New York. In New York. Yeah. More people were worried about the car than the <laughs> guitar. <laughs> but... Yeah. It's how did that relationship happen? And, you know, do you think that that makes you appeal to a younger customer? Or? Well, first of all, the, the relationship came about because Gary Lightbody from Snow Patrol and Foy Vance, who's another 
who we um, love as well. Fantastic yeah. musician. Mm -hmm. um, so Gary, uh, who plays my guitars, asked me if I would make a guitar for Ed Sheeran. This was maybe eight years ago, something like that. And I said, of course. And I went online and saw that Ed was playing these little tiny, yes. tiny little guitars. And I thought, well, I don't make any guitars, small guitars as small as that. So I went up to the North Coast in Ireland and designed, uh, spent a week and designed what we now call the Wii mm -hmm. Loudon. Yes. And sent it off to, to Ed. And then he got back in touch and he was writing songs on it. And the relationship kind of built from there and when he came over to play a concert in Belfast he came down to the workshop and we had a great time and uh, yeah it was fantastic so the relationship is just gradually built and then um but I wondered why he wasn't using them on stage because he was using them my guitars to record um and I wondered about that and his manager said to me one day said George the problem is your guitars are just too good mm. and I was like I, I can't, what does he mean? So I, I went to think about that and I went back home and I took the Wii Loudon and I redesigned it as a stage model for him. So I specifically made it for a very large sound system in stadiums. I changed the voicing of it and took it back to the sound man, uh, his sound man, Chris, and um, uh, he put it into the system, played it and said, I'm taking that to Singapore tomorrow. And from that point on, Ed's been playing my guitars on stage as well. So what you play on stage is quite different from what you play when you're recording. It should be. So we'll get to the journey of the business. Hmm. Do you believe that an artist can, can make a brand go on to an international scene? Not to make this too much about the mm -hmm. Sheeran guitars because mm -hmm. we want to talk about the Loudon guitars yeah. but we've seen it happen with PRS we've seen it happen with Ibanez with Fender I mean you know all the artists that have you yeah. know come on yeah. to play them right on the cusp of maybe a company <laughs> being in trouble sometimes yeah I think um, you've been played in the background sometimes yes exactly I think that I've seen it over and over again and coming from Northern Ireland and growing up during the time when we had all the political trouble and, um, you know, a lot of the artists were not coming to Northern Ireland then. I mean, yeah. there was probably 15, 20 years when nobody of any note came to Northern Ireland because of the all the bombs and yes. all that stuff. So, And it was uh, the perfect era of music, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. it was. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You know, the, the late 60s and 70s, 70s was, was my favorite Me too. music time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but I was frustrated by the fact that I was in my little workshop making these guitars and nobody had heard ab about me um, because of one of the big names, you know, just small musicians, beautiful musicians, particularly from Brittany and France, yep. loved the guitars. And, and, you know, that was enough for me in many ways. But I kind of felt it would be great if Eric Clapton played yes. my guitars and told me what he thought. Tell me about the Eric Clapton story. You said oh, you had an Eric Clapton story. It's slightly story. embarrassing, but yeah, yeah. Um, so in 19, I think it was about 87 or something like that, uh, I was in England over the Christmas holidays and I had five guitars in the back of my car and I decided I'll go and, I'll go and show Eric these guitars. Just like that? Just like that. That's the sort of mad thing that I do sometimes. And... Um, um, he doesn't strike me as someone who just kind of says hi and gives you a hug or. Well, <laughs> yeah, he, 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 yeah, I was, yes, I was definitely nervous about it, but I had his address and I mm -hmm. thought, why not? You know, mm. so I, I had the map and I was sitting in a road in the south of England, New Year's Eve timing, not very good. New Year's Eve, six o'clock, pitch black. I'm looking at the map and trying to find this address and. Up comes a police car, wind down the window. Those were the days you still wind down your window. And no and GPS. <laughs> no GPS, exactly. And the policeman said to me, are you lost? And I said, in my Northern Ireland accent, got to remember this was, yes, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I'm looking for such and such an address. And I said, it's where Eric Clapton lives. And he said, oh, yeah, you just go down to the next roundabout, take a right, go to the next roundabout, take a right again, and you're in Newhouse Village, and it's up behind the the pub told me where to go so I, I went 
And I knew I was in the right place because there was a, a full-size um, to genuine totem pole outside the front door. <laughs> Amazing. So I, I nervously knocked the door and Eric himself came to the door. Six o'clock, New Year's Eve, pitch black. Wow. A strange guy standing at the door. And um, he, he said, oh, take it easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Because obviously I must have looked very nervous. And I explained who I was and I said, look, I would love it if sometime you could look at my guitars and give me your feedback. And he said he would. And then, um, but of course, he said, but I have friends in tonight, so we can't do it now, you know. Um, but later on, uh, he saw Paul Brady playing in Ronnie Scott's club, I think mm, it was. Yeah, Ronnie Scott. And Scott's. Eric went backstage, played the guitars, really loved mm. them. And then Paul came to us, and then we made we made him uh, an O thirty eight. It was then, and he used that to record a uh, Pilgrim and Reptile, mm. two acoustic albums. Yeah. So we're very proud of that, you know. So um, we started at the same time as other brands like Taylor. Yeah. And when I look at the different, you know, paths that mm -hmm. different luthiers yeah. have taken. Yeah. Um, you've. We said we believe, I come from obviously a luxury background. I believe in the power of a well-made product. Mm -hmm. You can look at something made 50 years ago and it looks like it's it was just made yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. But certain companies, they got bought out and private equity and so on. They take mm -hmm. different directions. Mm -hmm. But you stuck to your guns. I'm pretty sure many came knocking. <laughs> yes. But you took it. You, and I'm sure... I heard you went through some pretty difficult times yes, as a right. business. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. If someone's watching this as just a business lesson, you know, it happens to be guitars, but it can really relate to anything, watchmaking, you yeah. know, yeah. furniture making, anything. Well, yeah, you're right that, that I, I have gone through ups and downs business-wise, you know, there's no doubt, especially in the, in the early years. Um, but I really believe in my heart of hearts that if you make something that is truly excellent, and I use that word, you know, really that's the right word to use. If you make something that is world class, there will always be people who want to buy it. And if you just make something that's just the same as everybody else's, then there's always, then people may still buy it, but that's not what I'm what I'm about so I just want to make the guitars better and better and better and try to do that I'm not sure that I always succeed but I, you know because I experiment a bit and sometimes I might think hmm maybe I'll take that voicing a little bit in a different direction or whatever you've but, been a great success story for us so it's been two years now okay you were the first brand we brought on board okay first with Sheeran so it's very emotional brand for us it's emotional that you're here with us today sure because it helped launch us as well as a business okay we had celebrities coming in for the sharing guitars Good. um and that brought a lot more people and a lot more yeah. interest and yeah. then that led them to the Loudon guitars okay but we could see it day in and day out incredible guitars coming in mm -hmm. and never heard of Loudon because this is a market that's very much driven by mainstream. This is across the board, by the way, it, whether it's cars or fashion, we're, we're a mainstream yeah. market. Mm -hmm. But the behavior, especially with high net worth, is moving towards niche. People want things that no one else has, yes. limited edition. Yeah. It's just where the world is, is going if you have the financial ability or you're yeah. saving up for something. But we really did not expect that we could convince them that easily. And it was purely based on quality. Yes. They would play it and say, wow, yeah. Yeah. I want this. That's right. So we'll get to the business story, but just to not lose the moment, tell us about the exceptional guitars that you've brought with you. Thank you. Okay. We're chasing Alistair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, tell us well, a little bit. We've got Nick with us. Okay. If you can, of course, to, to play something for to, us as well. To play yeah. something for yeah. us. But if you can tell us a little bit more about okay. the, ma the making of. So all of the, all of the time when, I, when the workshops have been in existence, 
at the same time, I've always personally made guitars on my own bench, you know, just myself. And um, not very many, you know, usually 10, 12, 20 a year maximum. Um, but I got to the point where I felt, you know, I want my sons to help me now to do these. And I would like a couple of the really best guys in the workshop to help. So I, I handed over my book, if you like, my order book to the company. And so we now make one or maybe two, sometimes two a month of these Master Series guitars. Incredible. And they, they are, I mean, we spend a lot of time and I, I have a lot of input into the voicing and, and, and the, the nerdy details of how to go about making them as, as just the very best we can. And What's the nerdiest detail for you? So one of the things I've started to do recently is I, I, I go through our, all of our individual bracing stock and I pick up pieces of bracing and I drop them onto the bench <laughs> and I listen to the, the, the tap tone that they mm -hmm. make as they fall on the bench and then I match up um, sets of bracing for each guitar to try. That's a small thing, but if you've got 100 small things or even 10 small things, then that gives you the edge. The guitar is going to be... What about the wood? They so, always say the wood chooses the, the guitar. In some ways. Especially if it's not a factory. Yeah, I mean, we yeah, I mean, we do things with wood that maybe not very many other people do. We make sure the braces are split, for example, mm. rather than just sawn. Yep. Uh, also, with alpine spruce, for example, I, I would go to Switzerland or, or, or France, and I would go through hundreds of soundboards. Uh, just rough cut. And sometimes I've seen me going through two or three hundred just to find ten wow. that have got something special. Mm. And so it's a What's quite special. So they they have a certain top tone, mm. rather what I call bell like. Uh, you know if you if you yes. a bell is mm. well a bell is yeah. a bell. Yeah. And sometimes when you lift up really good uh tone wood and tap it, you can mm. hear that. And also I flex it, you know, to see yes. I like it to be stiff and light. Mm. And so, yeah. So tell us about the guitars that are with us today. Okay, so we brought, well, we built two Master Series guitars uh, for Art of Guitar. One of them, it, uh, which Nick has now, is an S model um, with sinker redwood mm -hmm. top. So you can see the, the wood is very, um, uh, the wood is very dark. In color and uh, and that's because the sinker redwood is usually at the bottom of a river in in uh, california yep in lying, the redwood. lying there for yeah. 100 years or 150 years i was just going to say if you can tell people what i i love sinker wood sinker it's, yeah yeah it's incredible it's so sitting underwater for it's, it's been underwater for hundreds sometimes hundreds of years yes and what happens is that they um a lot of the resins are, are leached out of the wood mm. during that time. Yeah. And it makes the wood very light in mm. weight. Um, but it also quite often makes it colored. So you, so oak, for example, is a classic example, bog oak, which has been in a bog for 5,000 years, and mm. we have some of that. And oak is normally a kind of yellow color, new oak, mm. but bog oak is usually black. Wow. Mm, beautiful beautiful wood mm. um so the color is different but also the sound is different do you do you feel like we were in a world where let's say we talk about sustainability and earth and preservation yeah. and this is why i love also the idea that we're not you know when you're not mass producing yeah that we're also protecting our planet I think it's it's important that so we we try and buy as much wood from reclaimed sources as we can. So a lot of the spruce that we buy comes from Alaska, and that comes from logs that have washed up on the seashore or uh, from bridges that have been replaced with with modern metal structures. And they the old ones were made from from Sitka spruce usually. Yes. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of the wood comes from those kind of sources. That's as great. much as much as we can. Um, if we were making you know, a couple of thousand guitars a week or whatever the number would be, then it would be impossible to do that. And customers, what we're hearing more and more 
80% of customers, they want to buy a product that somehow has had some kind of sustainable element to it. I think it's I think it's really important, you know, a lot of Absolutely. I mean the uh, the back and sides of these two master shares today are Brazilian rosewood, which is a protected species. Yes. And uh, so you have to have a CITES license, mm -hmm. which we do have. Yeah. And what that license basically um, shows is that the wood was cut um, 50, 40, 50 years ago when you were still allowed to do that, but you cannot do it today. So and that's also the collectible exact. element so of it. So it's very, very, very rare. Yeah. When Rick and I set out to open Art of Guitar, that was the idea that you don't need to cut down more trees. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of guitars and wood out there. Yes. Let's make this a very responsible retailer. As, as responsible as possible. You yes. Know, um, like I said, if I was making large numbers of guitars, it would be much more difficult to yeah, do it. Absolutely. But even then, even then, there are ways that you can, um, uh, you know, for example, you can get involved in plantations. Mm -hmm. And replacing the wood and, uh, projects like mm -hmm. that. Yes, we don't believe in offsetting. That doesn't help anybody, no, right? No. So let's talk about the the masterpieces. We've got Nick with one of the pieces. So so this is an S uh, an S an S model, which is the small size, but not the smallest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, it is. At first, when you were playing it there, I thought, has he got that plugged in? No. And, and no, it's not. I know. I know. I'm biased. I'm, I know. I'm biased. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. You're biased, I'm, but I'm, it is. I'm beautiful. biased, but it will get better as well. That's mm -hmm. an interesting thing about guitars, you know, that if you play them mm -hmm. hard, uh, you were you were you were playing that quite. Yeah, I, I have, I'm heavy-handed. Okay, so uh, but that's good for a guitar. Yeah. Um, to bring to bring it out. There's a story of a of a shop in New York that sold classical guitars, and when somebody came in Which looking, uh, I don't remember the name, but. The story is that when somebody special came in looking for a guitar, uh, the owner would say, well, I've got the guitar just for you. And he would say to the to the store man, he would say, can you go down and get such and such a guitar from the, from the, the basement? And the young guy would go downstairs and pick the, take the guitar and hit it really hard for about two or three minutes before bringing it upstairs. So that to it would... To keep it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, yeah. Get it ready. So tell us a little bit about the, the inlay. You just the process of creating something so beautiful. So, um, so there's an inlay, a, a, a gentleman who lives in the States um, called Larry Robinson, who is a real artist when it comes to developing inlays. And he, he has made these uh, little small butterflies for us from multiple pieces of shell that just fit together. When you look at it closely, it's beautiful. Stunning. It's not like, it's not like some art that you have to stand back to get the effect. It's somehow the it's opposite. The you have to go close and then you see, oh, I see now. So we, we he makes them and then we inlay them at the workshops. Beautiful. I love that because as the whoever is going to be the lucky owner of the guitar, it's yeah. something that's very unique. Unique to yes. them. Each one, each one is very unique. Yes. Yeah. And we were saying how uh, in this market, we're seeing a lot more interest in the matte finish, you know, yes. the, this kind of simple ornate, not the overly ornate. So yeah, it's a lot of the car quite, companies are yeah. copying me now. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you saw that, right? The Aston Martin. <laughs> yes, I saw a, a matte, a yeah. matte copper colored yeah. Aston Martin. Mm. <laughs> Maybe that's a, the next yeah. color. Yeah, <laughs> we have another masterpiece. Yes, but I love the backstory on this. Rick came to see you. It just shows how long the process is. Probably a year and a bit ago. Yes, and he actually chose the pieces of wood that For these guitars. finally, you know. More than 12 months later, they're in yeah, Dubai. Yeah. And you're with us as well. It's, yes. it's a big deal. It's a big moment. Tell us about the second masterpiece. So the second uh, master series guitar is an F body, which is, the, which is what we call our midsize, a little bit bigger than the first one. And um, this one has an alpine spruce top. If you remember, I was telling you about choosing alpine spruce. Love alpine. Very, very difficult to get really good wood mm. and the back and sides are the very rare brazilian rosewood again and uh as you said uh, rick came to the workshops and made a choice i think he picked that, that one for me yes i'm thinking you're thinking that are mm. you <laughs> <laughs> with the bevel yeah yes yeah. with mm. the bevel and, yeah and um so yeah i mean this the the combination of brazilian rosewood and alpine spruce Al along with a couple of other ones like African blackwood and alpine and Madagascar rosewood and alpine are really the in my the inlays yes as well the, it just it has the inlays it's beautiful it, it, it's it gives a very warm but very clear sound and it resonates forever yeah so the sustain aspect of it's really important Nick what do you think it smells also good it smells good ah. yes it does. Right. What do you think, Nick? Uh, well, I look. I love it. I just tried it before this, and I think some some blues sauce would sound good on this. So, Nick, you're in the store. Yes. Often, you you're with your great customers. Tell us about the experience of the first time we got the Loudons, and we I were have showing actually a them. Really cool story. Yeah. About tell it. us. Oh, really? So yeah. So. I actually, before I joined the company, I came by the shop. It was just open, I think, for a few months. And I came to buy some cases from Rick. And uh, I walked into the shop and he was like, um, you should try this, you should try that. And I'm like, do you have any cool acoustics? You know, and he picked up a album that he has from 80s, I think. He's like, you should try that. And I tried that. And I remember saying to him, this is the best sounding acoustic guitar I ever tried. I didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. I was completely noob about it. But that was my first impression about all the guitars. Wow. And that's how Rick and I met the same And how old was that guitar, did you say? From 80s. It's 80s? From, yes. Well, you see, that just shows that the, the more you play and love a guitar, you know, the better it gets. If it's been built correctly at the beginning. Correct? So I have right. a guitar. My first guitar was from the 80s. And of course, by then it was so well played. Yeah. And Rick went and sold it without telling me that sounds that sounds like me you know i don't like to keep guitars i like to sell them <laughs> well that was All my it, it was it felt like that was made for me you know it's a parlor size you know and since then he every two three months he tries to say look it's a replacement it's a replacement and I'm, i say it just doesn't sound doesn't as it, good yeah. because of you know, it, it's aged. The and years of playing. So well played. And yeah. yeah, he's still trying, you know. Well, you know, that's one of the <laughs> Even things. Even Richard that, Hoover convinced me that he can possibly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it is true. I mean, if, if uh, not only playing a guitar for years brings it brings the tone out, but also that's one of the things about using really old wood, that yes. it's already in some that's ways true. ages. Yeah, ages that's why I like Sinker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Nick, let's hear something. Let's hear something. I'm going to play this one with fingers, right? Thank you. 
do you think? Well, it it sounds. I was going to say it sounds new, but actually. I think it sounds surprisingly warm. Mm. I, I was expecting it to, to sound a little bit new, a bit bright, but it, bright, it, yeah. it, it sounds warm. Full it's so, yeah, the other it's, one's brighter, it's, it's, it, it is. Mm. Well, that's typical for the S model, the yeah. smaller one. It'll bring out the trebles a little yeah. bit more. But this sounds <laughs> full spectrum. You yes. Know? Yeah. yes. How do you feel about interest in the smaller size, the S models? We're seeing a lot of interest in that. Yes, and... I mean, I think that the the sales of our S model are going up all the time. In some ways, I think it's the it's the ideal if it's made right. It has to be made right and yes. voiced correctly. Yes. Interestingly, I had Eric Bibb at the workshops the other day. Mm. Uh, literally the day before yesterday, was it? Yeah, day before yesterday, mm. he came to the workshops and he was he was playing uh, an S model f f in our workshops. And playing blues, of course. Yes. But he he fell in love with it and said, you know, the thing is, the balance is so perfect across the range from bass to middle to treble. And I'm beginning to agree with him. You know, at the beginning, my guitars were always big. Yeah. You know, we see people, you know, customers coming in wanting like a dreadnought, or and then you can actually convince them and they say, actually, that's very practical. Yes, it is. You can just sit oh, in front of them. You do it as yes. session players as well. So I play with a lot of musicians and I see guitar players coming in, different shapes of guitars, all mm -hmm. sorts of brands and everything. And I often sometimes steal a Sheeran or something to ask for an opinion. You know, What do you think about this? And and what everybody thinks is that the smaller, si smaller format guitars are great for stage yes. because of the mix. Yeah. You know, the treble cuts through, it cuts yeah. through the mix, you can yeah. hear the guitar perfectly well, uh, while my friends at front studios will always pick a very big guitar yeah. that has the full spectrum, they can play, they can play with it, they can tweak yes. the EQ That's however right. they like it. That's right. Is that the experience? What no, ex exactly that. Um, when you're recording, interestingly, Ed, Ed Sheeran, when he's recording, uh, quite often uses the S model rather than the Wii. Yeah. Whereas when he's playing on stage, he uses the Wii, and then he also uses the mostly uses actually the stage version of the mm. Wii, which is a, an extreme version of what you're talking about. Yeah. So the treble really cuts through, and the bass which is, is anyway. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's magic. The bass is anyway amplified by the uh, sound reinforcement system. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us what's next for George. You want to obviously you want to play golf. <laughs> when I can <laughs> when you can but you want to keep perfecting the guitars more and more we were talking about how we have music schools and really it's because we want kids to grow up especially for guitars this has been very much a piano dominant market kids have learnt guitar on very entry level low end of the market Yes, we teach on Sheeran's Mm -hmm. As I was mentioning, we changed the strings to make it easier to make it for a them. Bit lighter strings, yep. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know with my boys, Dean and Adam, it's uh, they play the sheer they play the Sheerans, but we had to change the strings for them. Okay. And I like that. I like that they they learn on a good guitar mm -hmm. because it, it it motivates them. You know, yeah. it's mm -hmm. a very different experience, and from the get go, you're getting them used to something really good. Yes. So what do you think about, in general, the guitar industry, where we're going? What can we do about bringing up a second generation of incredible guitarists? We talked about Abbasi and people like that, but also um, Luthiers, you know, the vocation of, of creating guitars. I'm worried about losing that. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think we're growing up in a very quickly advancing or quickly moving technical environment. Everything is changing so fast. And the kids are growing up and they they don't have much contact usually with the things that we would have had contact with as kids. You know, I remember as a kid, you know, uh, my father encouraging me to make a, a guider, what we called a guider, which yes, was, yes. you know, yeah. soap box really yes. with, with four four pram wheels and mm. those were the kind of things that we did. So we were very much in touch with hands. With, and, yeah, with yeah, hands. Craft. And, yeah. And whereas today it's it's not so easy at all. So 
anybody who wants to start making guitars and, and try and make a living from it, it's going to be even tougher than it was back then. And it was tough enough for me. You had to have, you had to have that yep. kind of determination. And the time, because now their time is filled, right? They've got electronics yeah. and so on. If you think about most guitarists, they they were bored. You know, there wasn't much time. They sat in a room all day and they had a guitar and they strummed yeah, all day. Yes, and I think I think you know? you know there was a lot of there were a lot of really good musicians back in the day when I was growing up. You know, um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Yes. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Clapton, Peter yeah. Green, you know, you could go on forever. These were amazing guitar players, mm -hmm. and they were an inspiration for young people uh, growing up who wanted to be a guitar player. In my case, I wanted to be a guitar player, but I was not good enough. So that's one of the reasons why I started making them, you know. But for me now, um, I'm in a very good position because my two of my sons are, uh, you know, moving on with the business. And... Um, so I've got the opportunity to teach them and have done with my older son. He's been with me since he was 18, um, most of the time. And then my, uh, middle son, Aaron, uh, has been with me since he left school at 17. So, um, I can look forward to them taking the business on, designing, uh, keeping to, keeping on designing new guitars, trying to make them better. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I wanted to ask about Nam. We were very proud to see the amazing booth. There was a lot of interest of all the great brands were there. Yeah. But there's a debate about the importance of NAM, if it actually improves visibility. Obviously, it's in the US. All the US uh, partners come there. I'm mm -hmm. just curious from your perspective, does it play an impact? Has it helped you in any way? You know, I think the thing about NAM is that when you go there, there are people from all over the world. And so therefore you get an opportunity to show what you do to the world. It's maybe not so important for some of the brands that have been here for 150 years because they're already known. But for, for us, it's really important. Of course, it's very expensive to go there, but it's also um, vitally important for us at the moment to be there. So I wanted to say that it was important for us as a retailer as well, yes. because we've backed Loudon from day, from the day we opened. Yes. So to see you there meant a lot. Yeah. There was a lot of camaraderie as well. Yes. All the other brands were also watching the partnership and the relationship. So that was really good. And I think we strengthened one another yes. by being there. Well, that's good. So it, it was, just great to see you there in, in a big way. Yeah, great. And I look forward to, you know, to the next seeing one. More. So I'll be going to I'll be going to the January um, show coming up. That's but great. I, have, I haven't been for a couple of years um, just because of other commitments. Because the Luthiers were there, you know, they they weren't really talking to a lot of retailers, but people knew they were there. You know, it did matter. It meant for the yes. a lot for the industry. Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. No, I, I believe NAM is um, vitally important for, for the new kids on the block, if you like, particularly. Yes. So we're in the Middle East, 60% of our population are young. Mm -hmm. And this is why Sheeran was a great way to introduce yeah. them to Loudoun in yeah. general. And again, our music schools, the kids playing guitars on the Sheerans. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal for us. And we're going to continue to encourage kids to pick up the guitar and fill up their free time with get, playing the with, guitar. With good stuff. Sports, yeah. you know, move mm -hmm. away from electronics. Yeah. That's the future. They're our future. Any lasting comments for us? No, I just, I'm just really shocked by how good this, the art of guitar is. I mean, it's, I'm not just saying that because I'm here, but it is really amazing what you've Thank done. You. It's, um, it's fantastic to go and see all of the guitars, but also to see them in an environment like this that encourages people to to play and to learn. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's fantastic. And we're, we're glad to be in partnership with you. Yep, thank you. I think what you said is true. When you put business and passion together, yeah. it works. It works. It yes. works. Well, I, I myself and business had to come to an arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, the arrangement being that, that rarely works with creative yeah, types. Yeah. Yes, well done. But, but I had to realize that um, good business gives the platform for good creativity. If if in some ways it's not it's not a, it's not a bad thing to go through tough times. It's good because you learn stuff. Um, and, and you've some, had your share of and I've had time. my share of that. Yeah. Um, but when you go through those things, you, you learn about real about real value. What real value is, and it's not just money. Right. In fact, it's not money. It's about excellence. It's about innovation. It's about um, inspiration. All of those kind of things, which are much more important. But you do need a certain amount of money to do those things. So. I could do three podcasts with you on very different topics. Yes. The next one is going to be about business and, okay. you know, how right. George has come Going out through. of all this yeah. stronger and better. Yeah. We wish you all the best. And thank you very thank much. Thank you for yeah. being in Dubai with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. We'll hand it over now and listen to some great music from Alistair. Thank you.